We saw in our image processing example that when you've got two different bases for a vector space, those gives you two different ways to look at the elements of that vector space. And those different ways to look at the elements of the vector space can give you different insights into those elements. The same insight applies to linear maps. A linear map whose matrix with respect to one basis seems complicated or unstructured could be much simpler with respect to another basis. And that can give you some insight into the behavior of that linear map. An important example of this is when there exists a basis of the vector space consisting of eigenvectors for a linear map. The matrix with respect to such a basis is particularly simple, as we're going to see in this video about diagonalization. So let's begin with a definition of diagonalizability. A linear map T from a vector space V to itself is called diagonalizable if there is a basis of V consisting of eigenvectors of T. Next, a matrix A, which is a square matrix with real entries, is called diagonalizable over the real numbers if there is a basis of R to the N consisting of eigenvectors of A. So that's equivalent to saying that the linear map from R to the N to R to the N, given by left multiplication by A, is diagonalizable in the sense of the first bullet point on this slide. And finally, a matrix A, which is N by N, and which has complex number entries, is diagonalizable over the complex numbers if there exists a basis of C to the N consisting of eigenvectors of A. So as a quick example, we've already met the linear transformation T from R squared to R squared, given by T of X, Y is this column vector here. We've also already seen that there are eigenvectors 2, 5 and 1, 3 for this linear transformation. Now you can check directly that they are linearly independent, or you can use the result that eigenvectors with different eigenvalues are always linearly independent. But when you've done this, you know that they are two linearly independent elements in R squared. So their span has got to have dimension 2. Those two things are linearly independent, so they are a basis for their span. That means their span is a subspace of R squared with dimension 2. So their span is all of R squared. And that means they're linearly independent and they're a spanning sequence for R squared, which means they're a basis for R squared. Therefore, there is a basis of R squared, namely the basis consisting of 2, 5 and 1, 3, which consists of eigenvectors for T. And so by the definition, which is the first bullet point up there, T is a diagonalizable linear map. There is a useful sufficient but not necessary condition for diagonalizability, which is that if V is a vector space of dimension n, and if T is a linear transformation from T to T with n distinct eigenvalues, then it must be diagonalizable. The proof just uses the criteria about linear independence, which we saw at the end of the last video. Let's say you take V1 up to Vn, which are eigenvectors for T with distinct eigenvalues. The result at the end of the previous video tells you that they are linearly independent. If they're linearly independent, then their span has got dimension n, because they form a basis for their span. So in fact, their span must be all of V, because it's an n-dimensional subspace of the n-dimensional vector space V. Therefore, they're linearly independent, they're a spanning sequence for V, so they're a basis for V. And we have shown that there is a basis for V consisting of eigenvectors for T, which is the definition of T being diagonalizable. Now, it's very important that this condition is not necessary for a linear map transformation to be diagonalizable. There are many diagonalizable linear transformations which do not have n distinct eigenvalues. It's very common to say, oh, if a uh, linear transformation is diagonalizable, then it's got to have n distinct eigenvalues. That's completely wrong. And there's a very simple counterexample, which is the identity map from a vector space V to itself. That is always diagonalizable because any non-zero vector is a one eigenvector for the identity. So any basis for V consists of eigenvectors for, for the identity and therefore the identity map is diagonalizable. But it does not have n distinct eigenvalues where n is the dimension of V. It only has one eigenvalue, namely the eigenvalue 1. So it's important to remember that if 
a linear transformation has dim v distinct eigenvalues, then it's diagonalizable. But the implication doesn't go the other way around. Just because it's diagonalizable doesn't mean it has to have n distinct eigenvalues. Let's look at what happens if you take the matrix for a linear map with respect to a basis consisting of eigenvectors for that linear map. So we'll have T from a vector space V to a vector space V being a linear map, and B equal to V1 up to Vn, a basis of V which consists of eigenvectors of T. And let's say that the eigenvalue of Vi is the scalar Ai. Well, in that case, the matrix of T with respect to initial basis B and final basis B takes this form. So that's what's called a diagonal matrix. It's zero everywhere except along the leading diagonal of that matrix. And the reason it takes that form is that if you look at T of Vi, well that is, well let's just think about T of V1. So T of V1 is because V1 is an eigenvector with eigenvalue A1, that's A1 V1. Okay, and you can think of this as A1 times V1 plus 0 times V2 plus 0 times V3 up to 0 times Vn. But T of V1 tells you what the first column of the matrix of T with respect to initial and final basis B looks like. First column tells you what scalars you need to use to express T of V1 as a linear combination of V1 up to Vn. And we've just seen those scalars are A1 and then 0 and then 0 and then 0 and then 0. So the first column looks like A1, 0 and then a bunch more zeros. And similarly, the second column tells you about how to express T of V2 as a linear combination of V1 up to Vn. But T of V2 is just A2 times V2 again. So the second column should go 0, and then A2, and then zeros all the way down. And of course this argument works for any of the vectors in this basis. So what you will get when you take the matrix of a linear transformation with respect to a basis consisting of eigenvalues of T is one of these diagonal matrices where all entries are 0 except for the entries in position 1, 1, or position 2, 2, or position 3, 3. Those things might be non-zero. Okay, let's look at some examples. Uh, actually, we'll do something else first. So we're going to do a result about diagonalizing matrices. So here we go. Um, we take a matrix A which is diagonalizable over a field F. So here, as usual, when I write F, I'm just referring either to the real numbers or the complex numbers. So let's say we take the matrix A and that this is diagonalizable over F. If it's diagonalizable, then there is a basis of f to the n consisting of eigenvectors of a. So we'll introduce notation for that basis. That basis is called v1 up to vn. We'll introduce some notation for the eigenvalue of vi. We'll call that ai. And we're going to let p be the matrix whose columns are the vectors vi. Then I claim that p to the minus 1 ap is a diagonal matrix. Specifically, p to the minus 1 ap will be equal to the diagonal matrix whose 1, 1 entry is A1 and whose 2, 2 entry is A2 and so on. And all the other entries are 0. So that big 0 just means that all the entries in that part of the matrix are zeros. Okay, so why is this true? Well, if you think about this matrix P, what this matrix P is, is it's the matrix of the identity linear transformation with respect to initial basis B and final basis, the standard basis. That's because if you look at the identity matrix applied to any vector V, so let's say V1 here, then that's just V1 again. And if you want the matrix of the identity with respect to the initial basis B and the final basis, the standard basis, you have to look at what are the coefficients which you use to express V1 in terms of the standard basis. But if you want to write this in terms of the standard basis, then this is just the first entry of V1 times the first standard basis vector, plus the second entry of V1 times the second standard basis vector, and so on. So let's say this is AE1 
plus b e2 plus and so on where b1 is a b and so on so the first column of the matrix of the identity linear transformation with respect to initial basis b and final basis e is just the entries of the of the vector v1 so the first column is in fact the vector v1 itself and the second column will be the vector v2 and so on so putting that together p is the matrix of the identity with respect to initial basis b and final basis the standard basis of f to the n and we've seen a nice trick with uh, matrices of the identity with respect to different initial and final bases which is that the matrix of the identity with respect to the bases the other way around is the inverse of the matrix of the identity with respect to initial basis b and final basis e so p inverse is the matrix of the identity with respect to initial basis the standard basis and final basis b now if we let TA as usual be the linear map given by left multiplication by A then the matrix of TA with respect to initial and final bases the standard basis is just A again so the reason for that is that TA of the first standard basis vector is equal to A times the first standard basis vector which is equal to the first column of A So the matrix of TA with respect to initial basis, the standard basis, and final basis, the standard basis, has its first column equal to the first column of A, and its second column equal to the second column of A, and so on. So in fact it is the matrix A. So now if we think about what is P inverse AP, well as we've just established, that's the matrix of the identity with respect to initial basis, the standard basis, and final basis B. And then the matrix of TA with respect to initial and final bases, the standard basis. And then the matrix of the identity with respect to initial basis B and final basis, the standard basis. So according to the change of basis formula, that is the matrix of TA with respect to initial basis B and final basis B. But B consists of eigenvectors of A. So as we've seen on the last slide, what you get when you look at the matrix of TA with respect to initial and final bases B is this matrix which I drew here, in other words, a diagonal matrix. And on that diagonal you get the eigenvalues of the matrix A. So when people talk about diagonalizing a matrix, what they mean is finding this matrix P such that P inverse AP is diagonal. And what we've seen is that in order to do this you need P to be a matrix whose columns are eigenvectors of A. Let's now look at some examples of diagonalizing a matrix. So we'll take A to be the matrix whose entries are 1, 1, 1, 1 and we'll let TA be the linear map from R squared to R squared given by left multiplication by A. So T A of a vector X is A times X. Then if you notice um, that T A of 1, 1 is 2, 2, and that's 2 times 1, 1, well that tells you that the vector 1, 1 is a 2 eigenvector for T A. Similarly, if you work out T A of 1 minus 1, you find you get 0, 0. And of course that is 0 times 1 minus 1. So that tells you 1 minus 1 is a 0 eigenvector for TA. Now these two vectors must be linearly independent. You don't even need to check it. They have to be linearly independent because they're eigenvectors with different eigenvalues. And you know that eigenvectors with different eigenvalues are always linearly independent. So these are two linearly independent vectors inside the two-dimensional vector space R squared. So they must be a basis of R squared. And that means there's a basis of R squared consisting of eigenvectors of TA, and therefore TA is diagonalizable. And if you look at the matrix of TA with respect to the initial basis consisting of 1, 1, and 1, minus 1, let's call that B. If you look at the matrix of TA with respect to the initial basis B and the final basis B, 
then what that will be is the matrix whose entries are like this, 2, 0, 0, 0. And furthermore, we know that this matrix can be expressed in a particular way. We know that it's equal to p to the minus 1 times a times p, where p is the matrix whose columns are our eigenvectors. So 1, 1, 1, minus 1, like this. And if you wonder what would happen if I took the eigenvectors the other way around, so what would happen if I took the columns of P the other way around, well, of course, P inverse AP would then be the diagonal matrix where instead of the diagonal entries being 2 and then 0, they would be 0 and then 2. So let's look now at an example of a non-diagonalizable linear map. We'll take D to be the linear transformation from the space of polynomials of degree at most K in a variable x with real coefficients to the same vector space given by d of f is df by dx. So this is a differentiation map. Now we already know one example of a eigenvector for d which is that the constant polynomial 1 is an eigenvector for d with eigenvalue 0. But up to scalar multiples that is the only eigenvector for d because no polynomial of positive degree can be a d eigenvector. If f is a polynomial of degree d which is greater than 0, then d of f is a non-zero polynomial again of degree d minus 1. So it can't possibly be a scalar multiple of f, and that means it can't possibly be an eigenvector for d. So the only eigenvectors for D are constant polynomials, and therefore unless k equals 0, there is no basis for the vector space R less than or equal to k of x consisting of eigenvectors of D. It follows that D is not diagonalizable. Finally, let's look at one reason why it might be useful to diagonalize a linear transformation. So why might it be useful to find a basis of your vector space with respect to which the matrix of your linear transformation is diagonalizable. One reason is if you were interested in finding powers of that linear transformation. So you might be interested in what happens when I do my linear transformation lots and lots and lots of times. What will be the long-term behavior if you do, if you repeat your linear transformation many, many times? So you're interested then in finding powers of the linear transformation. And if you've got a diagonal matrix finding powers of that diagonal matrix is very easy because for example if you have the 2 by 2 matrix A0 0 B which is a diagonal matrix then you, it's easy to see or prove by induction that its nth power is just A to the n 0 0 B to the n. Compare that with finding a form for the nth power of something like 1 2 3 4 and you'll see that this is relatively speaking very easy. So what's more, you can show by induction that if you have p to the minus 1 ap to the power n, then that's just equal to p to the minus 1 a to the n p. So just to see why that is, like if you took p to the minus 1 a p squared, well, okay, what happens? I get p to the minus 1 a p, p to the minus 1 a p, and of course these things in the middle just give you the identity matrix, and multiplying something by the identity matrix doesn't change it. So this is just p to the minus 1 a a p, which is p to the minus 1 a squared p. So you can use this idea to prove by induction that for any positive number n, p to the minus 1 a p all to the power n is the same as p to the minus 1 a to the n p. So if you've got a matrix p such that p to the minus 1 a p is diagonal, then p to the minus 1a to the n p is the same as p to the minus 1a p to the n, and that's just d to the n, which we can find very easily using the formula at the top right here. So you can then rearrange this equation to get a to the n is p d to the n p to the minus 1. So you multiply on the left by p and on the right by p inverse, and you change the equation right here into an expression for a to the n.
So this gives you a way when the matrix A is diagonalizable to find a straightforward formula for powers of A. And formulas of powers of matrices or powers of linear transformations can be very useful in applications of linear algebra, such as finding a formula for the nth term in a sequence. If you look back to one of your earlier courseworks, you'll see that we found formulas for the nth term of the Fibonacci matrix essentially by doing exactly the um, manipulations that you see on this slide. Equally, if you study probability theory, you learn about Markov chains. Markov chains are things where if you want, if you have some system which evolves probabilistically, so in which the state at time n plus 1 depends in some particular simple way on the state of your system at time n, then if you want to know about the long-term behavior of your system, then what you have to do is find large powers of a matrix called the transition matrix for your Markov chain. And doing that is much easier when you have a diagonalizable transition matrix because you can make use of the tricks on this slide.